Mr. Wonderful, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you very much. So, so where do we begin? Okay, so you're a renowned entrepreneur, investor, best-selling author, internationally known as Mr. Wonderful. Uh, so before we go into all that, I, I want to actually take it back to the very beginning and, and learn perhaps about some of the early experiences that molded you into the person you are today. Um, maybe perhaps even just growing up in Quebec and just your, your parents and your family, if, if you could share. Yeah, I mean, I... I um yeah, I thought I had a, a usual, uh, you know, childhood, but I found out later not so much because what happened was uh, my biological father died when he was 37 and we moved to Champaign-Urbana. My mother remarried and my stepfather was going to the University of Illinois and he graduated as an engineer from there. And then he took on a role in the United Nations as an expert in uh, development of uh, infrastructure for countries. And we started moving every two years, Cambodia, Tunisia, Ethiopia, Cyprus, Japan, um, you name it, I've lived there. And, and I just thought that was what everybody did. But I found out later that's not how it works. But in retrospect, it was a unique opportunity to see the, the way of the world. Very early on, I met Paul Pod in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I met Haley Selassie in, in, in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa. Um, you know, later I would find out, you know, how, how unique an opportunity that was. But it also gave me much more of a global, um, uh, you know, attitude in terms of how I invest. I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to invest in real estate in Cambodia. The French colonized it. Um, it's very successful. The Germans did a lot of work there. And so I'm an inter international investor. I invest in the United Arab Emirates. I've become recently a, a citizen there because I do so much business as well as being Irish and Canadian. So uh, th that kind of molded me and it changed the way I looked at the world. So I, I've read that you, you've said before that you learned a lot of your business intuition from your mother. Um, if, you could, if you could speak to that. Yeah, my mother was very pragmatic. Uh, she had had a you know, traumatic life in the sense that her, her life was turned upside down when my original dad died. Uh, she really believed in financial independence. She didn't want someone to have control over her destiny. And so from a very early age uh, in, her, in her life, she started putting away 20% of her income from her salary. And she was not a financial analyst, but she invested in telco bonds and S&P companies that paid dividends. And she had a portfolio for over 55 years, and she kept it secret from both of her husbands. And when she passed away, I got a call from the older brother, between my brother and I, from the executor of the estate. And he called me and said, you've got to come down here. Your mother died a very wealthy woman. I said, no, that's not possible. We're middle class. Um, she said, no, you've got to come down here. And lo and behold, I saw the effects of 55 years of compound dividends and interest, uh, how, what that can do for you and, and how you know, putting aside some of your income for your whole life accrues incredible benefits later. And that's really was the foundation of my investment philosophy because I saw it actually happen. And very few people have the discipline she had, but I always wondered how did she put my brother and I through college, help me with my first home, take care of her sisters, family members. Um, she never spent the principal, only the interest and the dividends. That was her philosophy. And when she didn't spend that, she let it compound. It's exactly uh, what I do today. I've followed her footsteps right to the T. And, and, I, and I've also learned that you've been very outspoken over the years in the sense that the businesses that you've invested in, um, you've been very upfront in saying that the ones that are women owned have tended to perform better, that they're ones that uh, they're just, they've just done better for you. I'm curious, why, why do you think that is? You know, it's, it's just, it's really interesting that you ask that question because a few years ago, uh, we started to notice the differentiation between our companies run by men and, and the ones run by women. And this is a period of over seven years. And the outcomes were significantly better on the female um, operated uh, companies in terms of outcomes. I mean, just, you know, you can't deny cash. I mean, that's what matters when you're in a private company and you're dealing with entrepreneurs. It's not a uh, return on capital. It's return of capital that you care about. And um, over and over again, these women outperformed. So we started to go look at how they did it. Because we had all the data for all these years. This isn't, this isn't some kind of you know, academic study. We had real numbers. And so we went back and we started trying to figure out what are they doing that's so different. And here's what we discovered. 
In, in the companies that uh, were run by men, in, in our case, they, they had very high growth targets, um, but they only hit their targets 65% of the time. And we were looking at that on a monthly basis. You tell me what you're going to do for this quarter. How are you doing during the quarter? And, they, and the men would hit their targets uh, about 65% of the time. And they had average growth rates, targets of 30%. Then we looked at the same data for the women, and we discovered that they hit their targets 95% of the time, but they only assumed, assumed growth of 15%. Now, why would you care? Why would that make any kind of a difference? And so we dug down another level, and we found out that, let's use an analogy of football. Let's say you're playing for Tom Brady during the years he was at the Patriots. They kept winning over and over and over again. Nobody wants to be traded. The Gronk was there his entire career and even went with Brady to Tampa. So people like to be on winning teams. The same thing in business. When you hit your targets each quarter, your attrition of staff is practically zero. And that really matters in a private company. You lose the person running uh, you know, logistics or sales or uh, compliance or accounting, it's very disruptive. But, but these women understood that and they said, okay, let's be pragmatic about our growth. Let's hit our targets all the time, keep the unit together. And so ultimately their outcomes were significantly higher. In fact, last week, here's a company called Base Pause, all right? This is cat DNA. You can't make this stuff up. I thought this company was a joke. I did it on Shark Tank. I thought it would be great TV, but what a stupid idea. You can buy a new cat for less than what the test Cost 29 bucks. Then the pandemic hits. This company just sold for a hundred million dollars cash last week. I mean, I, <laughs> so that's going to pay for a lot of mistakes. That's run by a woman. And, and she was really adamant to me saying, you don't get it, Kevin. There's 110 million cats in America. And I think everybody wants a cat DNA test to find out how to feed their cat for longevity. I said, you're crazy, but I'll take a shot with you. But there you have it. So these women, you know, you know that old adage, you want something done, give it to a busy mother. And that is basically what I think women are very good at. They mitigate risk, they manage, they can juggle a lot of things at once. So I'm very biased now. I do a lot of deals. I find a lot of women entrepreneurs because the outcomes are extraordinary. So, so this is interesting because speaking of cats, from, from my understanding, like during your MBA program, you, you had the opportunity to do an internship with Nabisco. It's working as, I think it was the assistant brand manager for their cat food brand. And, and from what I hear, you're not a fan of cats. So I'm just curious, what, what was that? What was that experience like? Yes, I was living at the time um, with my girlfriend who had two chocolate point Siamese cats and they are really... I can't even say the word. I have to edit myself. They were nasty. And they used to wake you up at five in the morning to eat. Like they don't, they didn't care. They just, they just cared about themselves. And I thought how selfish of them. But um, that was my first exposure to cats. But when I met Anna on the set of Shark Tank and she started talking about how passionate she was for this technology, I thought I'd give it a flyer. And, and then I, you know, the, the whole time in Nabisco Brands, it was, it ended up being a really, really important lesson. I'll tell you why. In life, you learn things and it goes into the back of your database, your brain. And you don't necessarily learn anything that moment, but it stays in your consciousness. And later you take that knowledge and you use it a different way. And I'll give you an example. My first day on the job at Miss Mew Cat Food at Nabisco Brands, the I was working for um, a product manager who was Dutch. And he, he said, listen, kid, I want you to, your project for this summer internship is to bring out three new flavors of cat food, but you've got to understand how this works. They said, okay, sure. You know, I'm quick study. He said, we're going to go to the rendering factory where we make the cat food. Cause I want you to really understand the, the engine of cat food, the two different engines of cat food. So when I got there, he showed me the, the, the rendering for beef. So um, chicken faces, beef lips, uh, pieces of cow that I can't even describe, put into a, a juice of papaya that would, would turn it into a paste. And we would crush that and add different flavors to it. So, that, so the protein was all the, you know, the stuff that people didn't consume. Um, chicken faces being my favorite on that one and beef lips, a lot of beef lips. Okay, so that's the beef. That's the beef engine. On the other side was the underbelly Sea of Japan tuna, the dark tuna meat that people didn't favor. 
So you had tuna and you had beef rendering, and those are the two engines. So you'd add some maybe uh, bits of corn or red pepper and call it gourmet, you know, tuna, whatever it was. But the thing is, people don't eat the cat food, cats do. And so we had this test center in upstate New York where we had hundreds of cats. So we'd create these combos, take them there and see how the cats like them because people would open the tin, put it into a dish. And if the cat didn't like it, well, they wouldn't buy it again. I mean, cats don't have credit cards, but their owners do. And you need them to, the, the owners want to see the cat eat the stuff. So what I learned was the mushier and more moist and more liquidy the, the, the cat food was, the more the cats liked it. So when I started blending my flavors between the beef engine and the chicken engine, um, I would keep that in mind. And I, you know, I met Fluffy the cat, which was 22 years old. The thing didn't have any teeth. Um, it was leaking out of every orifice, but it was one of the oldest cats in history. Cause it, and it actually had grown up on dog food, believe that. But you know, the whole, that, that whole idea, learning the two engines. Decades later, let me fast forward. We're at the learning company. We're growing our business internationally. We're in 30 or 40 countries, have thousands of employees. We're competing with other competitors. And I sat down with my team and said, guys, let me tell you the cat food story because I got an idea. Why don't we buy all our competitors with hostile takeovers and just do two engines? In educational software, there's reading, scores, math scores. So my theory was we can go in there and do the cat food strategy. We'll just have two basic engines and then we'll stick Rita Rabbit on one of them or you know, Bozo the Clown or Mavis Beacon or one of these characters that we'd license or Big Bird or whatever it was. We'd go license those and just use the same two engine strategy. Now, you, know, you can go back and Google this stuff and how skeptical the industry was of this idea, but I, it worked. Our cost of capital dropped by 20%. We ate all our competitors alive. We ended up owning the market in two years because we used what I had learned as a cat food dude and applied it to the software business. And I remember some critic at one of the companies called Broderbund saying to me, this guy doesn't get software. He thinks it's cat food. That's exactly what it is. It's cat food. You've got to understand it. And we ate them alive too. So nobody got in our way. We built, we built a huge business, but we, I learned it from that Dutch product manager. There you have it. So, so there's a lesson. There's a lesson in anything, and and I, and I'm curious because this is you know. So we talked about the software company, and when you took it public, you would later sell it. I think for over four billion, and you'd see episodes of Shark Tank start out, and they say Kevin O'Leary founded the software company. I'm curious what happened after that sale. So like once you sell it for you know for four billion dollars, like what's the next day like, or what's the next month like? Like what you know? It, did you jump right into the next project, or like how how were you spending your time? When you become an entrepreneur, it's if you're going to be successful, it's never about the greed of money. It's because you're so passionate about what you're doing. And if you are that way and you're not pursuing money, you're pursuing freedom. I mean, to a certain extent, if you love to get up in the morning and work, you're, you're setting yourself free. I, I, I enjoy everything I do. I don't, but the whole idea was at that time, we were working seven days a week you know, 20 hours a day. I was flying all over the world. We were growing like a weed and really, really competitive and being very successful and growing market share. And we loved doing it. We had a really focused team of, of uh, people that had been together for almost, you know, eight years. And we were brothers and sisters on this mission to be successful. And then we sell our company one day for $4.2 billion. And I remember that day, it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we all showed up for work again at seven in the morning the next day and looked at each other and said, what do we do now? <laughs> I mean, we were all filthy rich, but nobody cared because it wasn't any different than, than what we had been doing for seven years. And, and it was a very uh, difficult time for people to try and figure out what's next. Uh, because they didn't want to stop working. They, they, that was who they were. And I was in the same boat. And I've asked many other people since then that have achieved success, what happened? And, and, and they don't talk about the, you know, the day they sold their business. That's, that's not really that consequential. They talk about the day they started their business and why they started it. And for me, I'll never forget, you know, what took me on that journey was, I was in high school and 
I was working, and I've told this story many times before, but I'll tell it again because it's so relevant to others. I, my first job was working at an ice cream store called Magoo's Ice Cream Parlor. And there was a woman that owned it. And I, the only reason I wanted the job is the girl I was interested in in my class was working at the shoe store right across the mall. And I figured, you know, if we got out at five o'clock, I could kind of hang out with her. It was a good strategy for dating. And that's what happened. The first day I show up, there she is. She's waiting for me to come out. And the owner says to me, listen, um, before you leave, scrape all the gum off the Mexican tiles because the store had these beautiful Mexican tiles on the floor. But when you're scooping ice cream, you always give people tasters on a little wooden stick and they take their gum out of their mouth and throw it on the floor. So it'd be a big black mess of sticky gum, you know, uh, on the floor. And I, you know, she said to me, you got to scrape the gum off the floor before you leave. Now, I thought that would be bad for me because I'm, the girl was looking at me and I'd be on my knees with a scraper. And I said to her, look, this is not what you hired me for. You hired me to be a scooper and I'm not a, not a scraper. Um, I'm willing to scoop, but I'm not going to scrape. I thought it'd be very bad for my brand, you know, be on my knees scraping in terms of the whole dating thing. And she said, no, 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 no. I, I own this store. You're my employee. You'll do whatever I say. I said, well, not in the case of scraping. No can do. She said, well, how about this? You're fired. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I had no idea. I said, what does that mean? She said, get back on your bike, go home. Don't come back here. Here's your pay and cash for the day. And, and I said, what? Just because I won't scrape? She said, yeah. When you're an employee and I tell you what to do, you got to do it. Now you've been insubordinate and I'm firing you. I was so humiliated that I knew that moment, that second for the rest of my life, I would never work for anybody. I didn't care how I was going to swing that. I just would never do it. It was so against my whole DNA to be treated that way. And I learned that moment that in the world, there's two types of people. The people that scrape the stuff off the floor and the people that own the store. For me, I wanted to be the store owner. That's sort of what set me on my journey. And I never worked for anybody again. But years later, you know, having told that story, uh, we took cameras back there from one of the networks I was working on to find her, to thank her because she was the reason that I, at that time, I could afford to bulldoze them all if I wanted. And it, the only reason I had, had achieved success was she pushed me in that direction with that unique situation. And that's what I talked to entrepreneurs about. There's that moment. And, and, and just a couple of years ago, just to end this story, I get a FedEx envelope. Inside of it is a brick. It's got a blue paint on it. It was a piece of the mall. They bulldozed it to turn it into condos and someone else had heard the story and found me and sent me a piece of it. I thought that was full circle. Yeah. So, so there's a degree of irony to it, isn't it? I mean, it, it, you know, many entrepreneurs aren't very employable individuals and it's like you'll, you will trade that in and instead say, I'm going to go work 20 hours a day for years, right? Because this is what I won't do, but yet when I own the business, I'll do whatever it takes. Exactly. I mean, the whole point is entrepreneurship is not a destination. It's a journey. It's not for everyone. It's not easy. It, it's hard. But the whole idea is personal freedom. Today, each day, and I, I tell my students when I teach this, I say, look, the whole idea of being an entrepreneur is to get to a place in your life where you do not have to pick up the phone when it rings that nobody has control over your destiny anymore. If the phone is ringing and you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. And, and today I block my day in 30 minute segments. I work with this wonderful woman named Nancy Chung and a whole team of other people. But I look at the week each, you know, Monday morning and I say, okay, what do we got, Nancy? Let's look, let's show me this week. What do we got? Cause she's booking all this stuff. And if I see something I don't like, I just say, I'm not doing it. That's where you want to get. That's where you want to get. That, that you have, that's not about money, that's about personal freedom. I want to spend my time doing things that are meaningful to me. And that's that's the journey of an entrepreneur. I want to fast forward a little bit to even 2006 and talk about Dragon's Den. And, and I realize that a lot of like our U.S. listeners may not be as familiar with it, but before Shark Tank, there was Dragon's Den. And for those that aren't familiar with it, how would you describe how that show differs from what people know as Shark Tank today? Well, I, I learned... The, the, my journey into um, 
into, into the whole Dragon Sand Shark Tank thing was I had, um, I, I, was, I had been working at a, a private equity firm. And after the sale of the learning company, I was managing a mandate, uh, looking at other educational software companies that started to act as an investor. And I got a phone call um, from a, um, you know, one of the partners in the fund. And he said, look, Canada is selling off all its digital rights. And you have to be a Canadian to own the station. They're selling the movie channel, the dog food channel, this channel, that channel, but you have to be a Canadian citizen to own 51%. Fly up there, you have an unlimited budget and buy everything. Buy it all. Because uh, that was a, you know, the media, op the guy who was running the media side of that private equity firm. And I said, well, what do you mean buy it all? I said, buy it all. Uh, whatever the bid is, you pay a dollar more. I want to own them all. So um, that's what I did. I flew up there and there was a woman who's now quite famous. Her name is Janice Mackey Frere. She's a reporter, a global international reporter. Um, I think she's in the Middle East now for NBC. But at that time, she was working at a, at a network called BNN. And so she called me up and said, hey, listen, the word's out on the street. You're, you're trying to buy everything. Why don't you come in and we'll interview you about this auction that's going on, the digital auction. And... I had never done television before, but I figured, well, I'll just tell the truth. You know, I'll just get in a dialogue with her and I'll answer her questions. Well, she was aggressive. She was an aggressive business reporter. And, she, and I, she was being very, you know, what is this with you? You can buy everything. You can't buy everything. I said, sure, I can. I can I, I'm like anybody else. I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm Irish, too. Uh, but I'm, I have a Canadian passport and I want to buy whatever I want to buy. And she said, no, that's just we got into a, an argument. That's basically what happened on the air. And we got into a very heated argument on the air. And I wasn't going to back off. I didn't understand why I should back off. I was doing what I was supposed to do. She started crying. It was very emotional. The, the phone boards lit up. I mean, the thing just went crazy. Um, people were calling in. When we finished the segment, which was probably no more than eight or nine minutes, the producer came over to me and said, can you come back here tomorrow? <laughs> and that was the beginning of my television career. And I got into a show with her. We started going at each other. And then another one with a woman named Amanda Lang that lasted for like 10 years. Then Dragon's Den, Dragon's Den came along. It was a show in England. And um, it was a huge hit at the BBC. And it's still on. It's been on the air for something like... Uh, 20 years or 22 years or something, but it's basically the same show you see on Shark Tank, except it's in England. Then it was moved to Canada. And, and so we all went over to see how it worked. And in, a in, in guy named Peter Jones, who was a guest on Shark Tank last year, was one of the original guys on Dragon's Inn in England. I remember I got the call um, from somebody and said, listen, uh, Stuart Cox was his name. Come and bring your money and come to this show and, and you're going to buy uh, companies. And I said, why would I give you my money to buy companies? I didn't get the idea until I saw some of the tape from London. That was the beginning. And I've never looked back, but th the whole thing was Shark Tank. I got a phone call when I was working on another show for Discovery Channel called Project Earth as an investor in London, England. And it was Mark Burnett. Everybody knew who Mark was because the survivor and how successful he was. And he, he said to me, listen, I've got a show based on Dragon's Den, which you can see on BBC tonight in, in London, but I'm going to call it Shark Tank here in America. And I'm looking for a real asshole and you're it. And I said, Mark, why would you say that? He said, no, no, don't go changing. I'm looking for you. Get over here. There's two tickets at the airport. Um, I want to meet you at Shutters tomorrow morning. Talk about this opportunity for you. And uh, you got to get on the plane right now. They know they know me. They're going to let there's a limo outside. Just go to the airport. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. That's crazy. I got to fly for like 11 hours and then turn around and do it. He said, yeah, you want to do this. It's exactly what I did. I rolled into town, went to shutters, met Mark. We're supposed to spend an hour together. We spent like all day. Uh, we never talked about the show. Uh, everything else in life. You know, we were going through some personal issues with our own families and stuff. We talked about that. Um, and other things. But the next morning, a limo picked me up at seven o'clock and I met Barbara, um, 
Damon John for the first time, Lori, and we sat together <laughs> and that was the first time we ever did it. And I never looked back. Now I'm rolling in next week for the 14th season. That was 14 years ago. Yeah. And every year, uh, Mark says the same thing to me. He says, looking for that asshole, don't go changing. Man. Did, did you ever imagine that, it, even with Shark Tank, that it would become the, the phenomenon it is today? And I, I don't even mean just how many people watch the show every week, but also just in the sense that like how much the, of the movement towards entrepreneurship and the focus on small business just nationally, um, that that would be so popularized. Even just people who weren't entrepreneurs would enjoy watching it. Did you ever anticipate it would, it would blow up the way that it did? None of us. Not ABC, not MGM, not Sony. We thought if we were lucky, we'd get three seasons. This thing has... I mean, I go, you know, I was in a, I was in Geneva, Switzerland last year, uh, taking a train to Zurich because my stepdad lives in, in Geneva and I was on my way to Zurich to fly to uh, the United Arab Emirates from there. And this couple came up to me and said, are you the guy on Shark Tank? And I said, yeah. And they said, you're the most hated man in Austria. Can we get a picture with you? We're just getting married. <laughs> I said, why does everybody hate me in Austria? And they said, because you're so mean. I said, I'm not mean. I'm the only guy that tells the truth. If you can't handle the truth, wait till the real world bites you. But the point is the show has extended itself all around the world. I'm not a mean guy. I just tell it the way it is. And I think there's a role for somebody to do that. Somebody's got to tell the truth. You know, and Barbara's beside me saying, oh, listen, I'm not going to invest in you, but... You keep on doing what you're doing. Well, how disingenuous is, is that? They're going to go bankrupt. They're going to wipe out their, they're, they're going to lose their home. They're going to mortgage their house or something. I say your business has no merit. It's going to go to zero. Take it behind the barn and shoot it and try something else, which is what they should do. I'm not wrong about this. Well, and, and I will say, I mean, to, to a degree, I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard this, but you are a bit of an acquired taste. And I think when people first first see you on the show, they're like, man, this guy's a jerk and he's harsh. But as as they continue to watch the show, they actually see, OK, this person is disciplined, is not afraid to speak his mind. He's saying what everyone else is probably thinking. Uh, so it, it, in a sense, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm wondering and you said nothing was off limits. So I have to ask this. But after 14 seasons. It seems like you all genuinely like each other. I mean, it's, I mean, things obviously can get heated in the tank, but um, it seems like you all genuinely get along. I mean, is that really the way it is? You know, I think it's like a, the story of friends. You know, we've spent so much time together for so long. Well, I'll, gi I'll give you, an, you know, an anecdotal situation. The only reason Barbara gets to the set on time each year is I buy her a new broom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Listen, uh, she's a good friend of mine. We, uh, she makes dinner for me every time in New York. We've, we've, we know each other. We'll, I mean, what are you going to do? You've, I, I see that those people more than I see my family. And we sit in that studio for two months shooting that show. So, yeah, we know each other very, very well. But we don't have to agree on anything. And often we don't. I mean, I like royalties. I like return of my money. I like different structures than maybe Mark. So we fight about that. But so what? I, you know. I respect him. You have to respect all those sharks. Every one of them is self-made. They're all self-made and they're all self-made from different disciplines, different sectors of the economy. How can you not respect that, even if, whether you like them or not? And, and, and speaking of Barbara, I mean, it, it seems like you guys have a, almost like a special relationship. Um, now, I've heard, I mean, people obviously always wonder where the name Mr. Wonderful came from. Is, is, this, is Barbara really the one to thank for that? Well, we're trying to find the tape. We really are. It may have happened with another woman named Amanda Lang a year before Shark Tank started. We're not sure, but this thing's gone nuts because, you know, I, a few years ago, I got off the plane in Los Angeles and I went to, you know, I was leaving and the, the limo driver was there to take me to the studio and he had a card and it said, Mr. Wonderful on it. And I said, hi, I'm Mr. Wonderful. He said, oh yeah, I know. I said, you know my name? He said, yeah, you're Mr. Wonderful. And I said, no, my real name. He said, you're Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got the little nuts. And I'll tell you something. My wife does not call me Mr. Wonderful. That, 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 that was going to be my next question. So, yeah. uh, so you know, throughout all your experience, I'm curious, obviously our, our listeners are primarily business owners. What are the main things you look, you look for, you look at when deciding whether to invest in a business? 
Well, certainly these days, because I've been taught through the dynamics of this pandemic, which everybody's been through, I like to invest in entrepreneurs that have the ability to pivot, that are able to take a horrendously difficult situation and somehow fix it. I don't care how they fix it. Um, obviously, I want them to do it in a legal way. And that's the nature of business. You have to play by the rules and they, they do. But I want people that can pivot. And that's the most important thing for me because I don't care what your business plan is. It's not going to work out that way. It never does. It never does. You, you got you to gotta be flexible. And so that's number one for me. I like to invest... Invest in entrepreneurs that are disruptive, that are doing things differently. Now, if you tell me you have another hot sauce, I have no interest in investing in you. I don't want to invest in another hot sauce. The hot sauce industry is completely, you know, fragmented into zillions of hot sauces. Who cares? We don't need another hot sauce. I don't care what your granny's recipe was. I don't want another hot sauce or a soup or another soda pop. You know, that, that kind of stuff is not interesting to me. But when I see a great idea... Like a base pause, here it is again. That's a that's a well. I didn't think it was a great idea at the time, but I thought it was great TV. But wow, hundred million. That's pretty good. So so what has been? I mean, throughout, throughout Shark Tank, I'm curious. What's been your best investment? The best investment was a deal called Plated, which sold for three hundred and forty million. Also, my deal. Um, I've had some extraordinary outcomes on Shark Tank. So people should understand the real secret sauce of it is that because it goes into syndication and it's on all around the world, hundreds of millions of people see the show as it just keeps playing. And that reduces customer acquisition costs dramatically for the goods and services that are seen on the show. So the reason, you know, something like Base Paws or Blue Land, or I'm just looking for some of the other deals like Wicked Good Cupcakes, for example, which just got acquired also by Hickory Farms. Um, Love Pop, greeting cards. I mean, all of these things are seen on the show and people buy them. And so you don't have to pay to acquire the customer. They're, they're, they're acquired by television. And so it's the most powerful commercial in the world. That's how it works. That's why it works. And that's why we can create millionaires year in, year out. So is there ever a situation where you have an entrepreneur come on there and let's say it's, you know, it's not a massive business, but you can take a relatively large stake in the business for a fairly small amount, maybe a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand. And you know, because this is going to get millions of viewers, if nothing else, you either make your money back uh, just immediately, just from the episode airing, even, you know, regardless of what happens moving forward from the company, does that ever influence your decision-making when, when you're, when you're deciding to invest? Well, it does. And often that happens, not just for me, for all the sharks. I mean, the product is immensely popular because it's interesting and it's demonstrated on the tank. You get eight minutes of primetime television. People buy it right then and there. And most companies are smart. They do a Shark Tank night deal, a special bundle or something. They know they're going to air. So they say, look, you know, when the commercial hits, just go to this site, two for one. And they sell millions of dollars. I mean, I, I've had deals where I've made my money back in a couple of weeks. Yeah because the product was so popular. That was the case with Wicked Good Cupcakes. First royalty deal on Shark Tank history. Everybody thought I was nuts. And, you know, I got 25 cents, or 50 cents a jar actually until, you know, it was supposed to take three years to get my money back. I got it back in 90 days. One of the most successful deals in Shark Tank history. Uh, so I've been meaning to tell you about that. That you made your money back. That was us. That was my family. So we had, uh, <laughs> after that episode aired, uh, we've been probably buying it. You know, almost you know every month or so. And just uh, most recently, even for you know for Mother's Day, I was getting it for my wife. So um, love that product. What about on the other side? I I'm curious, like in terms of like bad investments from from Shark Tank. What, what's been? I mean, I, if you're able to disclose either what have been some of the worst investments, or if you don't want to name particular companies, maybe some of the lessons learned from those investments. Yeah, you know, there's great ideas. I think the, the best lesson is great ideas are a dime a dozen. Executional skills are really hard to find. The ability to pair executional skills with a great idea is what you're looking for because then you're going to have somebody that can drive the business forward, and that's the key. And so the, where I've lost money on Shark Tank is discovering later on that the entrepreneur I backed was a terrible jockey and couldn't run a business, you know, if they tried, they just had no executional skills and ultimately, of course, they're going to fail. And that happens. I mean, 
all venture investment is risky. You're going to get some winners, you're going to get some losers. But the whole idea is the returns are so geometrically higher than traditional investing, like 8% or 9% in the stock market, you get 1,000x or 100x or 200x on a deal in Shark Tank, you know, like, like a base pause or like a uh, plated that, you know, started in some guy's garage and then three years later sells for $340 million. Those are the kind of returns that pay for all your mistakes. And that's why you do it. You, and you can't know with certainty what's going to work and what is it. You simply can't know. And so you got to do a bunch of deals and then sit back and let it happen. Yeah. And, and actually on that note, you know, you know, years later down the line, or even when you're watching the episode once it, once it airs, are there any investments you look back and you kind of regret not investing? I never cry over spilt milk. I mean, because I can't do anything about it. I'd like to worry about things I have some control over. One of the things you learn in life, you know, as a manager, uh, you know, and an operator and an entrepreneur is focus on things you have control over. Don't waste your energy on things you don't. It, there's nothing you can do about it. So I don't, you know, the famous one in Shark Tank is uh, rain. I was the, he wanted six hundred thousand um, dollars at a time when no one even knew what ring was, and he eventually sold it to Amazon for one point one billion dollars. So had I given him the six hundred, I would have made about two hundred million bucks. I don't dwell on that. Uh, Jamie's a very good friend of mine. He's like the number three guy at Amazon now. We get together each uh, July four. We 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 have a big lunch, Galley Beach. In Nantucket, we've done that for a long, long time, and uh, you know we celebrate entrepreneurship there. We invite some of our entrepreneurial friends, and we do that thing each year. And, I, and for me, you know, yeah, I missed out on a deal, but I gained a great friend. Yeah, yeah, and and many of the people who listen to this podcast, so they're law firm owners, and one of the most critical aspects for them growing their firms is having a world class team. But oftentimes, you know, they may have a personal tie or relationships with people in their office uh, that perhaps cloud their judgment. What, what, what are your thoughts on this and how do you remain pragmatic of basically focusing on, you know, using your brain versus your heart? You need to listen to both, um, but you have to be pragmatic and understand you're, you're running a business. And the way I look at business is there's a pecking order. Number one are the clients. They're always first and you have to do things that take care of them first. In fact, you know, in the case of law, you almost got an oath to deal with there. So they're number one. Number two, it's your staff. They're really important because you can't run your business without them. Number three, if you have debt from a bank or an investor, they're number three. They're very important. You've got to take care of them. But my whole point is you're last. You're the last person. To worry about you're you're at the bottom of the of the the whole hierarchy because you own the business and so you got to take care of everybody else first. That's the way to look at business. Now, in the case of law, lots has changed, and I, I deal with a lot of lawyers. I mean, my goodness, I think about I bet you twenty percent of my day is dealing with lawyers from you know securities lawyers and uh, d you know documents that are on deals and banking relationships and all this stuff. I mean, it's lawyers, lawyers left and right. And I don't, but the good ones build brands. They create their own brand that they're known for something that they're very, very, very good at. And you always go and pay a premium for that specialist that does that one thing so well. And I encourage every lawyer to find that niche. What is it they're really good at? Are you a great divorce lawyer? Are you a great, you know, personal injury lawyer? Are you a great, um, you know, finance lawyer in terms of dealing with regulators? I have very specialized lawyers for that. So it's all about brand building and, and making yourself be in the top quartile of your discipline. Yeah. And, and, and as I'm sure as, as your brand has grown and, and even just, I mean, even just being on TV all the time, I imagine you have your share of critics and people who disagree with you and don't uh, don't like what you have to say. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people listening to this podcast that they themselves, as, as they've been growing their business, they're getting more critics. How do you, you know, either how do you deal with it? Do you just ignore it um, or, or even dealing with things like self-doubt? Um, what, what's your approach to that? You know, I had a mentor years ago named Jerry Patterson. He was my partner in one of my first businesses. He's dead now, um, but I won't forget him. He was actually um, an agent that took Russian hockey players and put them on the original six teams, Boston, mm -hmm. Philly, 
Montreal, Toronto, Detroit. Uh, and he was the first to bring the Russians in. You know, there was a very con- a lot of controversy, but they were amazing hockey players. And Jerry was the guy that did that. He took a lot of flack for that. You know, there was the whole taint of communism and all that stuff. I mean, you think about Russia, it's gone back to where it was back in those days in terms of branding. But, you know, here's what he said to me once. He said, you know, Kevin, um, the more successful you are, the more critics you're going to have. And they're going to be very vocal. Critics are incredibly noisy. And if you're to be effective, you're going to have to figure out how to create a filter where you don't take any of your energy and apply it to that noise. If they distract you for one second of your day, you're a loser and they're they're a winner. Critics are just noise. That's all they are. Now there's nothing wrong with, you know, listening to what they're talking about, but if you're spending your energy, you're stopping and you're not moving your goals forward because you're listening to a critic, you're wasting your time. and, And so, that's always stuck in my mind. I always have my little Jerry on my shoulder when some guy or woman is nattering about it. I did something they don't like. Here's what I can guarantee you with certainty. I don't care. It's not relevant to my goals to achieve success for my customers, my business, my investors, my objective. If you don't like it, I don't care. I thank Jerry for that. So. And I've taught this to my kids who get upset. You know, they get upset when somebody criticizes their work or something. You got to make yourself like an oyster in a pearl. You don't care because you're coated. You've coated yourself with protection. You figure that out. And this is another lesson I teach my young buckaroos in engineering cohorts that are graduating because a third of the class can be entrepreneurs. You've got to figure out how to learn to not care. You just don't care. And I'm going to say that to anybody that asks. Yeah. And so, so speaking of, of children, and I, I, want to, I want to get some parenting advice from you, hopefully, because uh, so I'm the father of two young girls, and, and I've heard you give out great parenting advice before, and I'm sure a lot of the people listening, they're parents of, of their own. Now, growing up, you know, my family and I, we immigrated here, started from nothing. We didn't grow up with much, so I wasn't very spoiled, but... My daughters, um, it's hard not to spoil them. You have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Uh, how do you not spoil your kids when, when you've achieved a certain level of success? Because you care about them. But I, I've heard you, you put your kids in coach and you're sitting in first class. I don't know if that's true, but just, you know, what, what, what is your advice on that? Yeah, that is true. And I'll tell you, I learned this from my mother. She hated entitlement. She hated the idea that somehow you de-risk the life because you destroy it when you do that. When I graduated from college, my mother said to me, look, I got good news and bad news. I'm going to come to the graduation. Um, and then she said to me, however, the dead bird under the nest never learns how to fly. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> like she said, it's over. There's no more checks. I have paid for your entire college. And um, now it's over. You've got to go make it on your own. And I said, mom, I mean, I I don't have a job and I have rent. And, you know, she said, I don't care. You're on your own. And I I was panicked because for two years I nearly went personally bankrupt and she just wouldn't. But she was teaching me something very important that I really applaud her for now that I understand this idea of entitlement being a curse. It's not a it's not good. It's a curse, because if you de-risk a child by telling them you don't have to worry about anything, They don't. And they end up in a very bad place in their lives. You, everybody knows some rich kid that's totally screwed up. Well, that's because they're entitled. And that's not my case in my family, because I learned that I I applied the same thing to my family. And I remember the day that we sold the learning company, that $4.2 billion transaction, I set up a trust and, and one of many trusts. And it was designed, I went over and I went over to the lawyers in Boston, we were in Cambridge, and I said, look, I want this trust to take care of any child in my family, whether they're conceived out of wedlock or not, from birth to last day of college. And after that, nothing. And he said, wow, even your own kids? I said, yeah. Um, 
It's a free ride from birth to last day of college, whatever that is. If they want to get a PhD, go ahead. But after that, nothing. And he thought it was harsh, but it was exactly what my mother did to me. And that's what we did. And when I went home that day, my kids were three and six. And they were sitting in front of, you know, TV watching cartoons. And I explained the structure to them right there. I explained how it worked. <laughs> and of course, they couldn't care less. They were watching a cartoon. But I felt they needed to know. Years and years later, when my son was doing really poorly in high school in Boston, and I was leaving with, I used, I used to love to go watch movies with my wife on Sundays. And uh, we did this traditionally, you know, before the week would start and often I would travel. So we'd go and see a movie together, go dinner and early dinner and then a movie. And so, you know, Trevor comes up to me before we leave and says, Listen, Dad, uh, one of my guys in my class has his own uh, trust fund. And I thought I had one, too. I said, you do? You're a very fortunate guy. Um, he said, well, explain to me how it works. And I said, well, if Mom and I get run over by a bus and we never come back from dinner, which would be horrible, but it could happen, uh, you don't have to worry. You're going to get to finish high school, but it doesn't look like you're ever going to go to college. Your marks are horrific. And he said, OK, then what happens? I said, nothing. I'm dead and you have no money and you finished high school. That's basically it. He said, well, that's it. I said, yeah, the trust works for you to the last day of school and you're not going to college because your marks are horrific. And I could see right then that he was facing the abyss. He had just figured out the trust, how it worked. And he was getting, and I said to him right there, the dead bird under the nest never learns how to fly. And he said, what the heck? It was exactly what my mother did to me. I said, you've got to figure it out for yourself. And I'm giving you every chance in the world to do that. You still got three years left. You got to hunker down. You've got it in you to figure out how to get some marks and get into college. That was the moment I think that changed him. Because today he works at Tesla. He's an electrical engineer. He went through the entire college system. It cost me a fortune, but he took me for my word that I pay for it. And he, he, he found his way, and now today he's got a great job at Tesla. I don't have to support him. I don't have to because he's doing it for himself. That's what my mother taught me. No entitlement. That's the whole idea. That's what you should think about. And it doesn't mean you don't take care of children and catastrophic health problems or something else. But if you give them a free ride, you've cursed them. That's what I say. So, so as it all comes full circle, I'm, I'm curious, your son that works as an engineer at Tesla, um, I heard he actually convinced you to buy stock in Tesla, which seems to go against all fundamentals and all just like, you know, I guess, disciplinary approach to investing in a company. Um, how did he convince you to do that? He convinced me that not just Tesla, but the entire electric car industry was actually not building cars. They were building computers that collected data and that ultimately... It would be autonomous driving would be the reward of the companies that did that. And that that was what I was missing because I thought it was crazy that I'd pay that multiple for a car company he said, I don't work in, a, in the car industry. I'm in the data industry and I'm collecting data. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I, I made, I, I invested that day because I didn't, I learned, so when you're an investor, you have to listen. You have to listen. Sometimes you think you know everything you don't. That conversation changed my mind about how I should think about EVs and the entire EV infrastructure. And I certainly have changed my mind as a result of that conversation, not just for Tesla, but all kinds of investments in wireless charging and lithium and other things that represent the future of energy and, and automotive and data collection. I even build data centers today. I do that as one of my businesses because I understand today, for me, that conversation started me thinking about data. Data is the new oil. Mm -hmm. It's more valuable than anything. Where do you put it? You have to put it in a data center. You have to power data centers with renewable energy. That's nuclear power and hydro. I go all around the world and I meet senators in Montana, North Dakota, upstate New York, governors in these states, uh, overseas. I'm in the data center business as a result of that conversation. So that, that's a full circle right there. Yeah. 
So, and, and we'll be giving away three, three Teslas in November at the, at the Game Changer Summit that you're speaking at. So as we come to a close, uh, Mr. Wonderful, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, what does being a Game Changer mean to you? It's changing the path for a better outcome. That's what it means for me. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a manager, if, if you own a business, if, you're, if, you, if you enjoy that work, you have to be a game changer because you have to keep moving forward. You're never going to you're never going to get to the destiny. You're never going to get to where you think you have to be. You're going to be in a journey forever, and it just gets more and more interesting. And so, great entrepreneurship is about enjoying the journey and understanding you will never get to the destination, and that's okay. That's what a game changer is. <laughs> 